so okay so friends uh, good evening i think uh, akash has told me probably 3 months before that i should be talking on the pphn and i was supposed to be on a discussion um basically the plan was to have the discussion on last sunday but i was in uh, muscat for another focus related discussion and as you all know today is 8 pm and there is a uh, also one of my favorite probably one of my favorite aspect is cricket and the movie 83 is coming on the tv channel so you can imagine whether should i discuss about pphn or should i see the 83 but i have to select akash or academics and i can watch that 83 later on so what what we are going to do probably next i i might have to take more time it might not finished in probably uh, the time duration what we are expecting around 15 minutes i might have to jump that time and thanks to akash he has given me liberty to explain uh, in detail so i think we have a lot of we have a lot of things to discuss today akash told me that we have a people from fellows dm neurotology dm neurotology few consultant in this group so if you consider the if you consider the fellows dm neurotology and dm dm neurotology there is always one question on pphn there is always a discussion on pphn in your viva so it's very important topic so if you consider we have a questions related to transitional circulation we have question related to a pathophysiology hemodynamics management aspect in that management aspect you have a questions on vasodilatory therapy you have question on inotropes in pphn you have a question on preterm bpd pphn and so on so you can imagine that this is the most important topic when we consider about the hemodynamics in neonatology so we will see that how how we are trying to cover these topic in the various sections and then we will will go few things here and there depending upon the time factor i will try to squeeze few points and i will try to go on to another points also so i think you all are well versed but still for important repetition just concentrate on the fetal lung development if we see the fetal lung development here we have canalicular stage we have sacular stage alveolar stage and then there is a post fetal part as we all know in the canalicular stage we have very small blood vessels we have few blood vessels less cross sectional area and we have very high levels of vasoconstrictors hardly any vasodilators in this canalicular stage so if you consider this canalicular stage in the fetus the fetus is in the stage of a fetal physiological pulmonary hypertension so the first important concept you all need to understand that the fetus is in the state of physiological pulmonary hypertension that is expected from the fetus and that is the need of the fetus so if you see the sacular stage that is 30 weeks onward there is a more pulmonary vessels area is increase and still the pulmonary pressures are high than the systemic pressure definitely slightly less pulmonary pressure than the 20 weeks but still very high if you see the stage which is probably what we called as a late preterm or early term where the vessels are increase area is increase but there are very very high levels of vasoconstrictors so when you say that very high levels of vasoconstrictors and very low levels of vasodilators this is the stage 
this is the stage where you have very high pulmonary vascular resistance. So when we consider this stage, we always request obstetric colleagues not to deliver this lady at 36 weeks, 37 weeks, 38 weeks. That is a late preterm or early term. Please avoid delivering these ones because the pulmonary pressures are quite high in that stage. So we also know that we also know that there is a normal transition. What happened in normal transition? There is a inflation of the lung. That is the first important thing we all know. And that has to happen. Ventilation of the lung has to happen before the clamping. And that's the concept of placental transfusion or delayed clamping. You allow the lungs to ventilate. Once you allow the lungs to ventilate, there is going to increase pulmonary blood flow. So ventilation, increased pulmonary blood flow, ultimately your pulmonary vascular resistance drops and by clamping the cord with the oxygen and nitric, you have increased in systemic vascular resistance. So this is very important stage. What we are talking now, there is a decrease in this pulmonary vascular resistance and increase in systemic vascular resistance. So in the postnatal phase, where you have almost only 13 to 20% of the cardiac output, which is going to the lung. Now, 80 to 90% of the cardiac output going to the lungs. So two things very important. Your cardiac output has shifted from probably the no lung to the lung. And what we all know that there are three shunts. We know that ductus spinosis, PFO, and at the level of PDA. These shunts play a very important role when we talk about the excuse me one minute. Abhinav Jali ko inform kardo please. Um, sorry about that disturbance. Um, I just uh, usual time of the reporting of the hospitals, as you all know. So what I was trying to say that there is a shift of the blood flow. That means lungs replace, fluid is replaced by the air, decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance, increase in system vascular resistance by main mechanism is the ventilation of the lung, oxygenation, and the use of nitric oxide. So these are the important thing happens when we discuss. So from fetus to neonatal, we are talking as opening of the lungs. We are talking as the clamping the cord, naturally closure of the ductus venosus, closure of the PDA and the closure of the PFO. These are the transitional circulation, which is the normal phenomenon happens in the newborn babies. <laughs> if this normal phenomenon doesn't happen, then we are talking as there will be the persistent high pulmonary vascular resistance. And that, that normal physiological, if you see this pulmonary blood flow, there is a sudden increase in the pulmonary blood flow at the time of the birth. So what you are saying here is x-axis is your, what we talk about fetus and after the birth. And the y-axis has pulmonary pressure, pulmonary blood flow and vascular resistance. So there is a sudden rise in the pulmonary blood flow which leads to the decrease in vascular resistance, ultimately decrease in the pulmonary artery pressure. So this is the normal transition from fetus to the neonatal period. And we also know that these are the factors which are important for inflation of the lung, oxygenation, and nitric. These are the factors which are responsible for decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. And if there is a problem with the inflation, that means too much inflation, or under inflation, or the problem with the muscularization, or problem with the compression, what we talk about maldevelopment, underdevelopment, or maladaptation. With severe hypoxia and acidosis, these are the detrimental factors for increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So these factors are main responsible when we consider about pathophysiology of PPHM. 
So what is this PTHN? It is nothing but your vascular resistance is high. That's why your pulmonary pressures are high. And they are associated with the bidirectional PDA. That's one shunt. Or they are associated with the bidirectional or right to left PFO. So the shunts at the level of the PDA and the PFO, they will be bidirectional or right to left. That's first important concept, what we need to understand. So the vascular resistance is high, pulmonary pressures are high, associated, associated shunts are there. That leads to right ventricular function, ultimately left ventricular function. So the pulmonary hypertension is nothing but you have high vascular resistance, you have bidirectional right to left shunt, you have biventricular failure. So these three components you should understand. So when somebody talks you about the pulmonary hypertension, primary pulmonary hypertension, persistent pulmonary hypertension, think about, think about what? That yes, I'm dealing with a high pulmonary pressure. That is one component. That high pulmonary pressures are associated with the shunts. These shunts are bidirectional or right to left at the PFO and PDA. Ultimately, the effect is on the heart, which leads to the right side failure, ultimately, left side failure. If you understand that, then we know that we have a problems because of these antenatal factors, like low like renal problems, leading to the severe oligodromias, water species, and pulmonary hypoplasia. These factors leading to the leading to the pulmonary hypertension. Or we have we have the uh, transitional factors which leads to the pulmonary artery pressure. Those are common in India or what we talk in the form of asphyxia, acidosis, or hypoxic respiratory failure. At the same time, we should have, we could have, sorry, we have intrinsic, intrinsic blockage of the vessel leading to the high pressure in the form of polycythemia. And all these leads to the very high pulmonary artery pressure. The commonest cause in Indian scenario, probably 80 to 90% is a secondary pulmonary hypertension. And that secondary pulmonary hypertension is meconium asphyxia pneumonia leading to, the, leading to the problems about the respiratory failure. And the rare, but there are problems in the form of left side dysfunction, pulmonary vein stenosis leading to the pulmonary venous hypertension. So we could have pulmonary artery hypertension, we could have pulmonary venous hypertension, we could have problems of the lung inflations, we could have problems about the compression or maladaptation. These are the things theoretical, we know that. But the commonest emerging problem in India now is preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. Level three units, those who are managing, those who are managing the babies who are what we talk less than 30 weeks in India, where you see the premature, extremely low birth weight babies with corium nanitis. And then, then this without steroids, with ventilation, with damage to the lungs because of the hyperoxia or hypocapnia leads to inflammatory response. These inflammatory response has a dysregulation leading to the, leading to the Issues related to the muscle, issues related to the vessel, issues related to the blood flow, ultimately lead to the pulmonary hypertension. So this is a big problem coming out where you are having level three units, where you are managing a lot of babies less than 30 weeker, and a lot of these babies are preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to take a separate class on the preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension next month. Um, I think a um, um, lot of you might be getting emails from my side or from my secretary. You will get that information. Uh, if you're not getting information, um, I'll be going to provide you my email ID and mobile number after the end of the session that you can write down and send me the SMS. That's the next class about the preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. I just I mentioned you guys that there is a lung disease which we know that there is a hyperinflation or underinflation. 
there is a pulmonary vascular disease in cases because of the issues related to the growth muscularization or decreased blood flow with the vein stenosis and associated heart disease in the form of right side dysfunction leading to left side dysfunction all these three factors lung vessel and heart in the preterm they will present as a high pulmonary artery pressures and you will see that 34 35 36 37 weaker you might struggle with ventilation you might struggle with nominal ventilation you might struggle with winning or oxygenation persistent that problem is still there so if you see the most important component about the pulmonary vascular resistance is we are talking as hypoxic respiratory failure so the most important thing here is a hypoxia and this hypoxia leads to the acidosis ultimately again increase pvr shunting and vicious cycle so if somebody is talking about pulmonary hypertension we should always think about hypoxia acidosis bidirectional or right to left shunt and worsening condition if we don't act fast they will undergo that scenario repeatedly so just now i mentioned that there is an increase in vascular resistance leading to the hypoxia and acidosis these factors ultimately lead to the right side dysfunction all these factors of right side dysfunction ultimately leads to the lv dysfunction and that is a vicious cycle and hence i told you that when we talk about high pulmonary vascular resistance that means high pulmonary pressure severe hypoxic failure associated with the severe acidosis leading to the biventricular failure that's the most important pathophysiological component if you understand this pathophysiological component then it is easy for you to manage these patients so just i mentioned we have high pulmonary vascular resistance we have right side failure and that right side failure leads to the left side failure and shock and you require a lot of inotropic support in these babies so systemic failure systemic hypoperfusion and shock these are the components you will end up in these babies if you see the cardiac pathophysiology the normally as you know as this is the normal blood flow we talk ra to rv to then pulmonary to the lungs veins la lv that we know and you have left to right duct and left to right pfo but when there is a mild to moderate pphn we know that there is a high right ventricular systolic pressure that leads to your tr jet with bidirectional shunts at pfo and pda that means you have increased right side after load and increased contractility in initial part if this pulmonary hypertension worsens then this shunts becomes only right side and there is a shift of the septum or bowing of the septum to the left side naturally your after load increases contractility decreases if it is still worsens this lv becomes dysfunctional so here right side dysfunction started because of right side dysfunctional septal deviation this septal deviation leads to the compression there is a decrease lv preload there is associated pulmonary venous hypertension decrease preload increase pulmonary venous hypertension leads to this left right shunt so sometimes you will see that pfo which is left to right your pda which is right to left your pd is is right to left and pfo could be left to right that's a severe form of phpn with rv dysfunction with lv dysfunction so do understand this important physiology that you are dealing with a heart dysfunction you need to pick up before worsening of the heart so this is just a revision what i told you that in cases of the normal babies you have normal after load mild to moderate after load increases severe definitely it increases contractility starts increasing but later on it fails diastolic function initially decreases and then later on too much decreased so systolic decrease diastolic decrease septum shifts from midline to the left side pfo from left to right becomes bidirectional and pure right to left and later on it could be left to right pda left to right becomes bidirectional and pure right to left lv preload decreases blood pressure decreases so lv also fails 
So we are talking about RV failure. We are talking about LV failure in severe form of PPHM. That's the main important thing what we are talking as a pathophysiologic animal. We do talk about the labile hypoxia. So there is a labile hypoxia. As you all know, you all are treating, I don't have to discuss this, that baby doesn't like touch, baby doesn't like light, baby doesn't like handling, suction, movements. You want to keep these babies. Disproportionate hypoxia, difference between pre and post ductal saturations, more than five, more than 10, you are in big trouble, murmur of TR jet, and naturally you have to do the hyperoxia test. But nowadays, we don't do the hyperoxia test because of the availability of the bedside echo in most of the centers. You diagnose early. But if you don't have echo, then do the hyperoxia test. Along with that, naturally later on, you do the hyperventilation test. And once your PO2 improves, naturally you are dealing with the, the sites where you are talking pulmonary. But if it doesn't improve, you have to hyperventilate. And still you are struggling. Ultimately, you have to do the echocardiography. That is what most important component. So when we discuss about the hemodynamics of the PPHM, we are talking about increased pulmonary resistance leading to the increased pulmonary artery pressure. How we are going to assess that? The increased pulmonary artery pressure, mainly by catheterization, which is not available in a bed to bed, hence you have to measure right ventricular systolic pressure. And then ultimately you calculate pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Along with assessment of the pressures, you have to always assess right ventricular functions, left ventricular functions. So your echo doesn't finish without assessment of the heart function. Right ventricular systolic functions, right ventricular diastolic functions, left ventricular systolic functions, left ventricular diastolic functions. You all have to assess that. That is the approach. So assessment of the pressure, assessment of the shunt, assessment of these parameters are very important. And as you all know, the gold standard for the assessment is echocardiography to see, to see these shunts, to see the TR jets, to see the septal deviation. Those are the ones associated with right and left sided functions of the heart. That's the full assessment when we talk about, when we talk about the functional echo. Now we'll come to that point. But when we talk about the functional echo, you have to assess the pressures. You have to assess the shunts. You have to assess the right-sided systolic diastolic. You have to assess left-sided systolic diastolic. That's your full, full echo when we talk about the babies, about the hemodynamics, about echocardiography. So in next 20 minutes, I will just, uh, I'll come back to this one um, uh, again. Just give me one minute. I have a, another screen to share. So I will have to, oh. Um, Akash? Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. You're audible yeah. and visible. Hemodynamics of PPHN, that's the screen. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now from pathophysiology, now you understood that you need to have assessment of pulmonary pressure, assessment of shunt, assessment of right side functions, and assessment of left side function. So today I will try to cover simple aspect of pulmonary pressure. Naturally, in future, we'll cover also the right side functions and left side functions as the time part comes out. But the methods of assessment of the pulmonary pressures are actual measurements by TR jet, pulmonary regurgitation jet, and by PDA or PFO shunts. Then we have the crude markers, the crude markers that this could be moderate or this could be severe. We don't have numbers. And these markers have correlated previously with the cath lab markers. Those are markers called as pulmonary artery acceleration time. Pulmonary artery acceleration time versus RVET ratio, septal position, LV shape, and LV eccentricity index. These are the markers we will discuss in next 20, 25 minutes. So that is the markers for measurement of pulmonary pressure. From this marker, you can consider that we are dealing with mild, moderate, or severe pulmonary pressure. 
so i think i think you all do this eco the best view to do the tr jet the first marker for assessment of the pulmonary pressure is a tricuspid regurgitation and the best view is a apical four chamber and and a plax rv plax rv inflowing these are the two views where you see the tr jet as a blue color and after your gray scale put a color after color put a continuous view doppler so once you put a continuous view doppler you get a velocity measure that velocity gradient so this is the peak of the velocity in this case the peak of the velocity is 3.67 meters per second apply the bernoulli's equation whenever you want to calculate any gradient trj mrj prj arj vsd jet asd jet all these jet or pulmonary stenosis aortic stenosis everywhere you will have to put continuous view doppler measure the velocity of that jet and apply the bernoulli's equation bernoulli's equation as you know 4 into v square and in this case if you see now 4 v this is 1 this is v the constant pressures in the ra by catheterization lab is between 5 to 8 for calculation purposes we take a lower value that is 5 that is ra systolic pressure so i got this i got this value of rv systolic pressure this ra systolic pressure that combines is a 59 so my pulmonary artery systolic pressure in this case is 59 that's how we calculate by trj pulmonary pressure that that's only one method lot of people do trj or pulmonary hypertension start treatment no your eco has 20 parameters and that's where people are failing that they do one parameter and finish the eco and that is what is the commonest mistake we do before doing these parameters you have to label a normal echocardiography structurally normal heart and the trj is the commonest problem seen in ccsd you have tga you have tricuspid atresia as uh, not tricuspid atresia pulmonary atresia severe pulmonary stenosis uh, you have dorv you have left hypertrophic heart you have epstein's anomaly all the conditions will have trj hence friends remember trj once you see please rule out structural heart disease this echo you are doing on structurally normal heart you are not doing on the babies of ccsd that's the second important message i want to give here so this trj you have measured that's one example i told you the steps apical four chamber color trj apply cw measure the velocity apply 4v square 4v square plus 5 that is your pressure so this is the another example four chamber color and you saw the trj major in this case velocity is 3.93 4 into velocity square 62 plus 5 67 these are the pressures for this baby so that is a one method of trj by one view that is apical four chamber view but i would say that always try to see the trj by rv inflow view plax view then rv inflow and in that rv inflow again velocity again trj velocity velocity gradient once you get velocity apply 4v square that is the pressure gradient pressure gradient plus 5 you you get the systolic pressure so trj should be measured by two methods apical four chamber method and plax rv inflow method that is about trj you also have 70% 60 to 70% babies only have trj not all the babies that means you are going to miss 30 to 40% of the babies if you only rely on trj hence i am talking all these methods to you especially the preterm bpd pulmonary hypertension you will not see trj you will not see prj you will not see the 
you will not see the PD also. So there are other methods. So this PRJ method, again, this is the short axis view. In the short axis view, put up CW, you get this velocity. If you measure the velocity of the peak, then you get systolic. You measure the lower velocity, you get diastolic. But preferably just measure this one. Again, same equation, velocity, 4V square, and velocity should be in the meters per second. That is also important. A lot of people make a mistake that they don't measure in the meters per second and they end up with the wrong diagnosis, the wrong measurements. So I told you 4V square, that V should be in the meters per second. That is what I told. This is another example of pulmonary regurgitation. That's again, put a velocity, calculate another example of peak velocity and this peak velocity, again, apply 4V square. So you can have TRJ, you can have PRJ. The P, PRJ can be seen in the short taxis view or plaques RV outflow view. These are the two views where you can see the PRJ. So I told you TRJ by two views. I told PRJ by two views. That's the four things I told you. Next method is shunt assessment. What is the shunt assessment? The shunt assessment is a PFO. And PFO should be assessed by subcostal, subcostal long axis view, subcostal long axis atrial view. And put a Doppler again there, which is a pulse view Doppler, and just see whether you are dealing with PFO bidirectional or right to left. If it is a bidirectional or right to left, that's a patient of pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, you need to assess the PDA. Now, as you know, the three leg view, that is a ductal view, put a Doppler at the pulmonary end of the duct. Once you put a Doppler, normally your pulmonary pressures are below and your system pressures are high, hence you get left to right shunt. So in the transitional period, in the first 12, 24 hours, if you put a Doppler, you will have left to right PDA because your aortic pressures are higher than your system pressure. Sorry, then your pulmonary pressures. And that's the way, that's where you get left to right. When you see such left to right, that is a positive deflection. That's a duct. What do you say? Left to right duct means your systolic pressures are always, or the systemic pressures are always higher than the pulmonary pressure. That means you are not dealing with the case of pulmonary hypertension. That's your safe. But when when you see the bidirectional, when you see the bidirectional PDA, or that's a bidirectional PDA, this is left to right, this is right to left, or you see classic right to left, that is a negative deflection, that is pulmonary pressures are high, bidirectional or right to left, that means your pulmonary pressures are higher than your systemic pressure. In the bidirectional PDA, the right to left component should be more than 30%. Those people who are doing eco, they know what I'm talking. So this is one method. In this method, you see the duct, you see the duct, put a Doppler, which is a pulse wave, and you get this right to left. In this right to left, measure the velocity of this right to left. When you measure the velocity of the right to left, Again, apply Bernoulli's equation, 4 into V square. You got pressure gradient. Now, you know the systolic blood pressure by invasive or non-invasive method. By cup method or by outline method. You have a systolic blood pressure. So you know that, suppose this baby's systolic blood pressure is 50. And with this 50, I have right to left also. That means, the systolic is 50 and the pulmonary is above that. What is above that? You add, you add this velocity, you add these four V square pressures into that 50. That is your pulmonary pressure. So in this method also, you get numbers. TRJ, you got number. PRJ, you got number. PDA, you got number. How to number? I told you bidirectional or right to left measure the 4V square of right to left component. And, and once you have that, 
that's what i'm telling you that once you have that this is the this is example of right to left this is the velocity of right to left 2.7 velocity per square that is your pressure around 30 and i know the systolic pressure by measurement of cuff 40 40 plus 30 70 pressure i got in this baby that is what i am talking here so what we are talking here we are talking here as a supra systemic pressure i know the systemic and the supra systemic these are right to left so friends when you are talking bidirectional this component should be more than 30% once this component is more than 30% then do the right to left component measurements so this is the chart which is very important when you see only left to right pda that means your systemic pressures are above than your pulmonary when you are talking about right to left your pulmonary pressures are above than this one so what you do the systolic blood pressure plus pressure gradient of right to left pda that is what we do major so these are the numbers you get these are the methods you get numbers in cases of bidirectional also systolic blood pressure by inversion non inversion and you add pressure gradient of right to left pda that's what i told you so that's a method of shunt and from shunt you calculate the pulmonary pressure same method you apply for same method you apply for pfo same method you apply for vsd also so any shunts which are bidirectional which are right to left by this method you can calculate pulmonary pressure the normal values in the newborn less than 35 35 to 45 is not mild pulmonary hypertension 45 to 60 is moderate more than 60 severe pulmonary hypertension after 3 months number is 25 because as you know in the transitional circulation pulmonary pressure is still high the next methods the next methods of measurement of pulmonary pressures these are the methods which you can actually you cannot measure the numbers but you can say this could be moderate this could be severe pulmonary hypertension so this method is always present in all babies which is called as pulmonary acceleration time normally acceleration is slow and deceleration is also slow and it produces laminar flow of mpa so this is this is the laminar flow it is produced acceleration is slow and deceleration is also slow this is called as parabolic or laminar flow of mpa through the short axis view so that is what that is what is normal phenomenon but in cases of the this is the normal phenomenon of laminar flow but in cases of the pphn what happens this is the normal phenomenon this is what i am talking about normal acceleration and normal deceleration but what happens in pphn this becomes strangle so you can see the laminar becomes strangle there is a sharp rise in acceleration or it becomes w so when we say it is sharp it is called as moderate pulmonary hypertension when we say w it is called as severe pulmonary hypertension so dear friends remember these statements that by this method you can able to say that this could be moderate this could be severe pulmonary hypertension that's called as pat or time to peak velocity so pat means pulmonary artery acceleration time tpv means time to peak velocity that is one method so this is example of normal this is example of triangle moderate pulmonary hypertension this is example of w pattern which is what we are talking as severe pulmonary hypertension that's again w pattern severe pulmonary hypertension when your pad is less than 90 it is moderate pulmonary hypertension when the pad is less than 40 that's what we calculate the time that is what we say is severe pulmonary hypertension so the normal values are more than 100 less than 90 to 50 is moderate less than 40 millisecond is a severe pulmonary hypertension the next method is pad and ejection time ratio so you saw the pad now you can you have a pad number measure the rvet that is ejection time and find out the ratio same again same naturally again same short axis view take a laminar flow measure this peak that's a peak 
from this end to this end peak that is a uh, that is a pad or tpv and measure the rvt and that ratio if the ratio is less than 0.3 and especially less than 0.2 you are in big trouble so pad rvt ratio that is what i am talking here this is the tpv in this case is 44 milliseconds and rvt that's rvt and if you see this is ratio is 0.2 tpv rvt ratio is 0.2 that means this baby has i told you 0.3 to 0.2 moderate less than 0.2 is a severe pulmonary hypertension that's again crude method it's not accurate numbers so i told you with the pat or tpv the second method is pat versus rvt ratio that's the second method the third method is a septal position and this septal position you need to see into the short axis papillary muscle view at the end of the systole normally you see nice normal curvature this is the normal curvature of the septum in moderate pulmonary hypertension this septum becomes flat in severe pulmonary hypertension this septum becomes bowing into the lv because this septum turns out this way that's one method you can say this is moderate pulmonary hypertension this is severe pulmonary hypertension you end up with the shape of the lv changes that's another method that is a shape that is a first shape of the shape or sorry the position of the septum and shape of the lv here you see the shape of the lv is o shaped when the septum becomes flat it becomes d shaped when the septum becomes bowing it becomes crescent shaped as a moon shaped moderate pulmonary hypertension severe pulmonary hypertension that's again crude method very important method example of o shaped example of d shaped example of crescent shaped some of the pictures example of again o shaped example of d shaped these are the examples when we say o shaped naturally systemic pressures are more than the pulmonary pressure when we say d shaped the systemic pressures are about so pulmonary pressures are about than systemic more than 50% crescent shift more than 100% you are in bad pph so i talked about tr jet and pr jet i talked about pd and pfo i did talk about tpv tpv rvt septum lv position lv shape these are the various methods i talked one more method is research method but you should just know because you all are doing dnb neurology or dm neurology so which is again same view of a papillary muscle view which is called as lv eccentricity index that means measurement from parallel to this septum that's one measurement and the perpendicular measurement is a second measurement ratio of these two normally less than 1.2 normally is less than 1.2 in cases of in cases of pulmonary hypertension this ratio worsens another ratio you need to see the rv versus lv in this in this view it is less than 1 as you know but again which deteriorates so what we are talking here see this example this example now this ratio is 1.27 which started worsening this ratio is 1.5 which is worsened this ratio is 1.9 that's a crescent shift this is a flat that is a d shift this is a crescent shift this is 1.97 this is the normal this is the normal 1.03 here you see the rv by lv this rv by lv is less it's it's more than, basically more than 1 so that's a problem so these are the examples what i showed you these are lv eccentricity index and rv lv ratio so i told you a lot of things it's not only trj friends a lot of people just oh trj pulmonary pressure this start this 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 no do everything trj prj pfo pda tpv tpv r et ratio septum lv shape lv eccentricity and rv lv ratio very important that's again rvlv ratio these are important
naturally on the visual thing you will see your rarv dilated that is the first impression in pd you see llv dilatation here you will see rarv dilatation that is very important when we discuss about these parameters i will not go the measurements of rarv that's not the part of the discussion today but definitely these measurements naturally requires it's not so one day thing or one point thing it requires training it requires attention it requires ownership it requires experience and achieving competency i started my eco in 2002 and today is 2022 and still i struggle some days so it is still lot of things we all need to do we all need to learn from each other games i think few of you this is the book which we have written on the cranial ultrasound for the focus that's that's my um, mobile number and email id that's the book is available this is the lung ultrasound book i think few of you already got this is the neonatal functional echo book again all these aspects are included in this books and the recent textbook of clinical neonatology all these ultrasound related topics cranial ultrasound cardiac ultrasound lung ultrasound all the topics are written by our team you can go through that all the material you will get there that's what i feel that ultrasound is a visual stethoscope which is very important and that's the reason we started the opportunity to think about every neurologist after 4 or 5 years they have to learn they have to learn ultrasound and that is very important and hence we started this concept of first e module from last year february to june and we have trained almost 800 people a lot of people ask me how you are training online and people from various parts of india we don't select from one part so that you get lot of exposure for that new focus that is the where and that's a first course actually which we have there we have received almost 79 applications for third batch and i'm going to take interview in the first week of april to read before that sessions of july that's that's what we do that session will start in per july and that's i told you that this is the first course with a lot of mentoring of images and videos on day to day basis and those people who are interested in this focus that's my details that's where um, my mobile number and my email id so that is about hemodynamics about pulmonary pressures because of the time factor we have a separate one hour session on ventricular function of right ventricle one hour session on left ventricle function one hour session on cardiac output one hour sessions on the shunts so it's not uh, uh, pfo shunt one hour pd shunts two hours so it's not feasible to cover but this is a basic framework i have covered today in this section also there are a lot of things which has to be there so um, uh, uh, so that's that's a part but i will come back to the management part now because that's where uh, um, just uh, i will again i will again come back to the management part um akash can you please uh, yes sir it's visible thank you so um, these are the points we have learned from the last almost 50 minutes or 40 minutes i know whenever you feel i think chair person or akash that it is going out too much things are happening you stop me i have a habit of talking two to three hours um i told you that 
I pref- I have selected academics over this 83 match. So you just let me know that, sir. Please stop. It's not easy. Please, please continue, Dr. Yeah. Pandey. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I'm going to continue, but it's 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 a very healthy, lengthy session. But we'll uh-huh. see that. Oh, so, the, they are all very interesting people who want to listen to you more and more. Yeah, yeah. So these are the things. These are the things what we learn so far pathophysiology about decrease in pulmonary resistance, increase in systemic resistance. Failure to decrease pulmonary resistance, what we talk about PPHN, hypoxia acidosis is more problematic, and biventricular failure is the one which is most common things what we're talking. And that is echocardiography gold standard just now discussed. These are the points we discuss. Now let's see the let's see the scenarios what we are talking here. And these scenarios in your data. These scenarios are in our day-to-day practice, and we'll discuss about these one. A classic meconium, asphyxia, meconium distress, issues with the perfusion, issues with the blood pressure, issues with the ventilation, high frequency, under pressure oxygen, hypotension. And just now I showed you the echo. That's a, that's the echo of this baby, apical four chamber, severe TR jet, pulmonary pressure measured 67 with a bidirectional PDA in this baby. And this is the bidirectional PDA in this baby. At the same time, the baby has the bidirectional PFO. This is an example of bidirectional PFO. That's a subcostal, subcostal long axis at atrial level, RA, LA. And this is what we say. This is the bidirectional at the atrial level. Shunts are bidirectional. All primary pressures are high. But the good thing is that the ventricular functions are normal in this baby. That's the functional echo which we have done. And you guys observed from that one. So this is what you guys have seen so many times in the pictures that this baby has a TRJ, this baby has RV dilatation, this baby has a bidirectional PFO, bidirectional PDA, classic PPHN. Classic PPHN, what we are dealing, let's see what happens about the treatment. The most important part, which, what are our goals? Our goals are avoiding or treating the oxygen or treating the oxygen therapy, avoiding hypoxia, Maintaining the perfusion and decreasing the pulmonary resistance. That's the goal we have to achieve in cases of naturally the pulmonary hypertension, what we are doing. So when we see about, when we see about, this is the important slide about the summary slide, but probably the first slide, that initial stabilization is the most important. In India, a lot of these babies are outborn, hence they're hypothermic, hypoglycemic, hypocalcemic, hypomagnesemic, probably polycythemic. These are the things which give more trouble. These are the things which we are in problematic rather than these things. Hence, we have to concentrate stabilization. We have to concentrate on recruitment of the lung. We have to concentrate on vasopressors and vasodilators. These are the four components we discuss about the babies when we think about such baby what we just saw. So the basic management comes as the oxygen therapy, recruitment of the lung with ventilation, with opening of the lungs by the surfactant therapy and side by side vasopressor therapy to improve the blood pressure. So just now I mentioned, most important thing is please maintain the normal, normal, normal. What are normal? That means temperature, calcium, magnesium, sugar, electrolytes, all those things, please keep in the normal range. Everyone has a role and that role you have to maintain in cases of pulmonary hypertension. The most important factor, most important drug, which is still there is oxygen. But you don't want too less and you don't want too much. In Marathi, we call Uz Gor Dala Manun Mula Sakat Khaunata. Means don't give too much and don't give too less. You have to maintain that in the range because oxygen is a powerful vasodilator. So when we're talking about oxygen as a powerful vasodilator, we need to work as avoiding that oxygen as very high because the high oxygen has a free oxygen radicals so when we talk about when we talk about this high oxygen we are creating these free oxygen radicals and these free oxygen radicals naturally impairs the endothelial nitric oxide synthesis and ultimately when you say that nitric oxide synthesis is impaired by this endothelial nitric oxide synthetase enzyme, we are in big trouble. So naturally, we have this dysfunction 
or ultimately leads to vasoconstriction. So one side you want to work as a vasodilator, but because there is hyperoxia, because this hyperoxia, you end up with vasoconstriction. Hence, old technique of giving 100% oxygen, old technique of keeping saturation 97, 98 gone. We are all happy between 95, 90 to 95. We all are happy with the saturation of 50 to 80. That is the first golden rule in case of pulmonary hypertension. So we talked about oxygen. Think about normal blood to carry that oxygen. That means you need to maintain that hematocrit. You need to maintain that hematocrit and hemoglobin in the first week, preferably between 12 to 15, 12 to 14. That's what you require. You might require blood transfusion in some babies. Maintain that hemoglobin. You don't want polycythemia. I just mentioned one of the cause of pulmonary hypertension is polycythemia. You don't want polycythemia. You don't want anemia. Both are important. So what I told you, oxygen is a potent vasodilator, but hypoxia is a detrimental as for the brain, as you all know. Hyperoxia is also too much detrimental because of the formation of free oxygen radicals. Ultimately, vasoconstriction, impairment of the nitric oxide. These are the issues. Hence, you want saturation 90 to 95. Hence, you want your PO to between 50 to 80. Preterm, I keep 50 to 70. Term, I keep preferably 60 to 80. These are the range, nothing in the books, but these are the range of the practical things what we do manage, manage day to day. That's about initial stabilization of oxygen. Very important. Oxygen you might have to do through the CPAP, through the gentle ventilation, or through high frequency. That is the need of the baby, what you have to decide. The second thing what we are talking here is the most important thing is lung recruitment. Any disease in the neonatology, your lung has to be recruited proper. If your lungs are not recruited proper, medications will not work. Hence, the golden rule in neonatology is a proper recruitment. And that optimal recruitment is I choose your FRC. You don't want under inflation, you don't want hyperinflation. You are happy with the posterior reaps of eight to nine. That is very important. Because under inflation also has a problem in the form of worsening hypoxia and hypercardia. Over inflation will decrease your venous return, leads to systemic hypotension. You don't want both. And what you want, you want ventilation. You want gentle ventilation. You don't want to create pressure trauma, that is barrel trauma, volume trauma, atelective trauma, flow trauma. All the traumas you don't want. Basic neonatology. You all know that, but still I'm repeating. You might have to use high frequency and please use early surfactant. Especially in cases of meconium, in cases of pneumonia, use early surfactant. Because if you don't open the lungs, your nitric will not open, work. If you don't open the lungs, your oxygen will not reach there. Hence, recruitment or opening of the lungs is the most important thing. And that is where a lot of time we struggle of management of pulmonary hypertension. My golden rule here is that use that surfactant as a water and open that alveoli, open the recruitment. Because if you do that surfactant, you will be able to open the lungs and improve the Mismatch, improve your vasodilatory effect. What is what we want? We want ventilation here. Here you could see the you could see the blood flow. Here you could see the PO2 and the PCO2. You don't want you don't want hyperoxia. You don't want hypocapnia, and you don't want high ventilation because both of them will affect your pulmonary blood flow as well as cerebral blood flow. What do you want? You want your PO2 between, just now I mentioned, you want your PO2, what is preferably is in cases between, I told you that 52, maximum 70-80, your CO2 has permissive hypercapnia, which is between 40 to 55, that is acceptable range in these babies. That is what we are discussing. Otherwise, it will hamper your pulmonary blood flow, it will hamper your systemic blood flow, it will hamper your cerebral blood flow, which you don't want. So what is your target? Please. Old days are gone. You don't want alkalosis. This slide probably just for teaching purposes I've written, but I don't accept any pH nowadays above 7.3. I'm happy between 7.25 to 7.3. That's my acceptable range. PO2 between 50 to 80, CO2 between 40 to 55 rates. Naturally, you might have to use the you might have to use the assist control here, minimal chest rise, proper sedation, proper analgesia. Avoid paralysis, avoid hyperventilation. So,
So what you have to avoid? much handling, avoid too much noise, avoid, avoid too much suction, finish the thing in the golden hour. The first golden hour is important. If you want, put a right radial artery line, always put right radial artery line, that is a preductor. You might require, you have to put UVC or line because you require multiple drugs. Intubation. And once you finish in one hour, please don't touch baby too much. The biggest thing happens in medical school. Resident has taken round, senior resident takes the round, lecturer takes the round, professor takes the round, these too many rounds. One person has done echo, second person has done echo. Oh, I got a good finding. Third person does the echo. All these handling deteriorates the baby. One person, one echo is enough. Yeah. He can save the images, he can save the videos, and other can see that. Don't do too much handling. Otherwise, baby deteriorates. And to, to recovery of the baby takes more time. It is too much time. So that should not happen in these cases. That is very important. And that's what I've written that. What do we want target ABG? We also, we also want a normal blood pressure, preferably between 40 to 50. You also don't want too much. You also don't want too less. Normal saturation, 90 to 95. If you are transcutaneous, very few units in India has a transcutaneous PO2, PCO2. If you have that facility, then use the transcutaneous SpO2 PCO2 again in the mat normal range. The most important thing, a lot of babies of this meconium, especially in asphyxia, will require high frequency ventilation. And in my own unit, we use early high frequency ventilation. I don't, I don't wait the PIP of 25. My cutoff is 22, 23, because I don't want to damage lung, tidal volume probably 5.5 to 6, if I to more than 60, and your PO2 is still high, your, sorry, PO2 is still low, PCO2 is still high, especially in meconium. I use early high frequency. I use early night, I, I use early surfactant. Hence, the role of nitric has gone down. Nitric is white elephant. Lot of referral babies, they only require nitric. In one babies, I don't require nitric. So use of the high frequency, Along with nitric, very good results. But I would say that high frequency plus surfactant, that's the best thing. That gives you a quick, quick recovery. And if you are using the high frequency, then nitric, okay, that's the one what you use. And that's what I told you that in cases of meconium, pneumonia, early onset sepsis, I use liberal surfactant. And they have good results. If you see our own paper that surfactant therapy for congenital pneumonia, which was quoted in the IDS guidelines also. So we use surfactant quite frequently for congenital pneumonia. Similarly for meconiums, we use early, and we use second dose early within six hours also. Surfactant improves your liquid mismatch. It decreases in shunting. It decreases need of nitric, naturally decreases need of ECMO, which I don't have, but that's what is better outcome. Our indications are that once your OI starts crossing five, six, I start giving, preferably at five, I say, okay, shoot. If I do, in term babies, 40%, in the late preterm, about 30%, I use surfactant. So early surfactant therapy, what we use in these babies, that is what, what we try. Dose is same, monitoring is same, as you know, a lot of you are doing that, but still I'm repeating these ones, which is very important. If you see the lungs, if you see the lungs, which is the lung disease, naturally there are collapse, there is old distension, and there is hypoxic respiratory failure leads to increased vascular resistance. If you use the nitric in this lung without surfactant, some lungs are still collapsed. Still there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance. But if you use the nitric after surfactant therapy, so this is the surfactant therapy, then you use the ventilation plus nitric, you have a fantastic opening of the all lungs. You have fantastic improvement in the oxygenation, OI, and you have a decreased PVR in these babies. That is what we are talking. Hence, this is enough literature on that. Please use surfactant early in the secondary pulmonary hypertension, especially meconium, pneumonias, and sepsis, where you should use this one. 
that is very important once the baby is stable once you have acceptable gas then start winning now i have not touched the natic i'll come to the natic later on because that's where people all will think once my pressures are less than once my oxygen is less than 50% then and then i touch the pressure or map till that time i don't touch and the pressure is extremely slow winning one if it is a high frequency map by one if it is a pip in conventional one or two max but i don't touch too much bring down the pressure to 18 to 20 bring down the map in term babies by 8 to 9 in the preterm up to 6 and then think to shift into conventional or then think to extubation extremely slow winning of the vasodilators oxygen which is the one which you win the first not more than 2 to 3% suppose there is 100% come to 98% 96% 94% every 30 minutes once your saturation is above 95 pressures i told you 1 to 2 drugs by 20% suppose you are on 10 mics then come to 8 mics 6 mics that's your win about the drugs so winning is art if you learn the slow winning but also you don't want hyperventilation also you don't want too much also so sometimes you require more gases or you can see proper tidal volume you can see proper oxygenation that will be beneficial so this is what i think basic you learn the basic management you learn about saturation monitoring you learn about surfactant you learn about the maintaining of the conventional ventilation high frequency ventilation and monitoring of the monitoring of the vital signs that is what is major things which is important because initial management is the one if you manage that initially well you might not require a lot of time high frequency you might not require a lot of time nitric oxide a lot of people say i don't have nitric oxide okay doesn't matter stabilize the baby very important in one hour so remember this one hour period which is important what about vasodilators now we have two vasodilators which are available importantly nitric and sildenafil some units have nitric most of the teaching units are nitric now but still some units struggle with nitric we'll discuss that for sildenafil so you want to improve your systemic pressure and you want to decrease your pulmonary pressure and naturally we want to decrease your pulmonary pressure for that you require early use of vasodilators so in this case initial stabilization and use of vasodilators normal ventricular function blood pressure is also okay so i think early use of these vasodilators which are acting on cyclic gmp as nitric oxide as you all know improving cyclic gmp leads to vasodilatation i'll come to that sildenafil later on but these are the ones which you need to think about early use as you know the nitric oxide has action on cyclic gmp you know the nitric oxide is a selective pulmonary vasodilator that's the beauty of nitric oxide because it is inactivated by methyl by the uh, hemoglobin in the circulation hence it has no systemic side effect that's the beauty of the nitric oxide it also has a micro selective action and that's why it improves your ventilation perfusion and that is what you require surfactant to open up the lungs to improve that things hence combination of high frequency and nitric just i told you combination of high frequency nitric oxide has a better results if you see the if you see this uh, uh, gonzalo trial where plain nitric versus nitric plus surfactant plus high frequency they have a better outcome decreased death decreased need of ecmo hence when you use surfactant early which has a better result when you use the combination of high frequency surfactant nitric better result what i am trying to tell you i think a lot of you know this one but um, what what we do as oi i don't wait till 20 nowadays i start at 15 that might be too much but for early thing we do early that's what i told you surfactant also we do early so early hammer fast don't wait till 20 oi i that's what i i feel that if we target at 15 naturally we start with 20 dose agree on that and the response you see in 10 to 20 minutes response in the form of improvement in saturation response in the same improvement in po2 and response in the form of ratio of po2 to fio2 but the best response once you start immediately 
After five minutes, resident will come and she'll say, sir, happy, happy, happy. Saturation is improving in body. Immediately, the all team is happy. Everything is happy. That's the beauty of the nitric oxide. And that's the reason why we say it's a magic drug. Winning, I think, again, in individual protocol. The my unit protocol is that I wait till 50% oxygen, that is 0.5. Some units say 0.6, but I wait, I wait till 50%. And then PO2 is more than 60, less than 80. That's what I maintain. 60 to 80 in term babies. Saturation between 90 to 95. Once your PO2 is 50%, I start winning. Naturally, what we do is same protocol, high parts preliminary every four hours, little high parts. And then slowly one by one. What about the nitric in the Cochrane data? Yes, we all know. Nitric is the best drug for hypoxic respiratory failure in a term baby, early term babies, preferably about 35 weeks, what we're talking. The preterms we don't have enough literature. We know about decreased need for ECMO, improved OI, improved PO2, all the Cochrane data, as you know, but still repetition. So nitric is a safe, effective in term and near term babies. In the preterm babies, it is still, we are not talking as the first line, we are talking as, as a reserve medication for the purpose of when you are, don't have options, then you might use or in cases of severe BPD pulmonary hypertension, that time probably some people are trying, but in preterm at present moment, there are no no for nitric, but a lot of unit must have used as a case reports that as you know. The problems of the nitric is one is availability and cost. In medical school also suppose, a medical school like us, where the day of cost goes 25,000. So it's a big problem. 30 to 40 percent non responder. It's not like all the babies will respond. It's not 100 percent thing. Maintenance is there, cost is there. That's what I said. It's white elephant. My statement for nitric is white elephant. So please work on that early management. Please work on stabilization. You might not feel top out. So that's what is the nitric about starting and weaning. Those simple things you can, all those things are in the books. But still, as you know, nitric has for hypoxic respiratory failure with a documented, documented. For nitric, you should have echo must. Structure in normal heart, echo with severe pulmonary hypertension. That is mandatory. OI, I told you, I don't wait now 20 or 25. I start with 15. That's my cutoff. Dosage 20, as you know, monitoring, you require all the basic monitoring and then you start winning. Nowadays, I don't do the methemoglobin because most of the nitric we are using is three to four days. Once the baby is not responding to that, please stop early. Don't wait five days and seven days. Most of the nitric you are happy between three to five days, maximum three to five days is enough. Don't play with that, it's very costly. So that's what we don't do methemoglobin. And we are happy with the basic management of that three to five, what we are talking here. We have to be careful about optimization. You don't want over ventilation. You don't want under ventilation. For nitric, your recruitment has to be good. That's what I just mentioned. Proper ventilation, proper surfactant, good recruitment, then and then you should have a good thing. Nitric is contraindicated when you have diaphragmatic hernia with your LV dysfunction or drug dependent circulation. That time you can't use the nitric. That is not here, or the preterm less than 30 liters. The next question comes in the mind. Is sildenafil is the new nitric? That was the 20 years before we were talking, or 15 years before we were talking in India. What is this sildenafil? As you all know, the sildenafil is a potent vasodilator. This is a phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase high inhibitor. Again, again, action on the cyclic GMP and Naturally, we have vasodilatation through this effect. And then we say that the dosage of oral is one to two milligram. IV dosage is 0.14, three hours followed by 0 0.07 maintenance. Special role for sildenafil is in the preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. Naturally, sildenafil is not without side effects. You have to be careful about the bleedings, hypertension, Pulmonary hemorrhage, these are the major complications. 
because sildenafil is also systemic vasodilator it is not only a pulmonary vasodilator so that's why you have to be very careful about sildenafil as you all know pokhran says as you know that the sildenafil is for ppchn especially in resource limited settings where nitric is not available reduction in mortality almost by 2% that's rr is very good so you have to be you have to be well versed with the use of sildenafil that's the cochran data as you all know you all follow see that there is a improvement in oi and that's some important thing what is important is that most important thing is that your blood pressure should be normal or you use the vasopressor to improve that blood pressure and then think about using sildenafil otherwise lot of time you will struggle using sildenafil and hypotension be careful sudden deterioration very severe hypotension you might have to stop that sildenafil because severe systemic hypotension is a major side effect and common side effect about sildenafil we know that there is oral sildenafil and iv sildenafil but there is no trial about oral versus iv so one of our dm candidate dr chinmay has done this comparison of oral versus iv and that what yes see the he has compared the mortality and he has compared the complications naturally most of the parameters were comparable but the babies with the babies with the oral sildenafil were more sick babies and the babies with the oral sildenafil as a less complication so sick babies with less complication by oral sildenafil what he has documented and that that paper now is in the pipeline for publication so that is what we need in india that yes oral is effective and we need to document that and that is what is what he has documented that the oral sildenafil has similar response to the iv sildenafil with a lower complication rates hence we can use oral sildenafil in indian scenarios so what is the first thing i want to tell you the first thing i want to tell you in the approach in india the most important approach is initial stabilization that's the backbone this backbone is for oxygen therapy or recruitment with ventilation and high frequency ventilation but early surfactant therapy is very important early nitric oxide if your nitric is available i told you i don't wait for 20 i start with 15 that is my first line but if i don't have then we use oral or iv naturally that's the second line return but some units as a first line we need to stabilize your blood pressure by fluids vasopressor steroids we'll come to that point but that is the most important aspect that's the first case what we discuss with a normal ventricular function so we have discussed that there is a pulmonary hypertension but ventricles are okay so far so that what we are talking about let's discuss the case 2 this is the late preterm gift of india outbound baby severe late onset sepsis suspected late onset sepsis probably clepsil or acinobacter hypotension ventilation along with that along with that functions of pulmonary hypertension trj mrj bidirectional pda this baby has pulmonary pressures documented as g2 by the trj tpv or vat just the most crescent shape and this baby has lv dysfunction this ea ratio is less than 1 this rv ratio is less than 1 so this baby has ventricular dysfunction that's a marker of that's a marker of severe dysfunction as ea ratio by tissue doctor also you can document the methods of the ventricular functions are different so these are the methods of ventricular dysfunction pulmonary doppler is another method of ventricular dysfunction what we have documented in this case by echo this baby has late onset sepsis with vasodilatory shock with with a dysfunction so when we are talking about the dysfunction we have another vasodilator we have another vasodilator which acts on the phosphodiester 3 and that is mil action as a relaxation of myocardium that means 
whenever there is a rv dysfunction or lv dysfunction there is a relaxation there is inotropism lysotropism effect that's a combined dual effect and hence we call inodilator and that's the beauty of milnone but the problem with milnone is again it has a systemic vasodilator also so one side we are talking one side we are talking milnone as improvement in rv function improvement in lv function improvement in a pulmonary vasodilatation but there is issue of systemic vasodilatation also so be careful like xylenafil it has a systemic vasodilatation so milnone with a systemic vasodilatation systemic hypotension so just now i mentioned milnone as a inodilator so we are talking as a milnone inodilator various studies various studies about the milnone there are case series which all documented decreased oi one of our dm resident dr reema has documented use of the milnone it late onset sepsis for the purpose of ventricular dysfunction and improvement in the improvement in the oi and improvement of mortality when you use milnone again that one paper is in pipeline from her side as improvement of the ventricular functions after use of milnone so milnone in the pulmonary hypertension that's what we say that this was the this was the cochran is that time we have yes we have less studies but that is lot of units are using milnone especially in come babies but we need more data about preterm also for milnone people are now thinking about use of the combination of milnone and nitric oxide that means synergistic effect of cyclic gmp and cyclic mp so when you think think about use of nitric plus milnone or sildenafil plus milnone we don't have indian data on this one sildenafil plus milnone so suppose some students are listening think about this one thesis about use of sildenafil plus milnone that could be better because when you are thinking about this when you are thinking about this pulmonary hypertension you are thinking about ventricular dysfunction and you are thinking about increase after load this this increase after load you are thinking use of the nitric oxide and for these for this ventricular dysfunction think about use of milnone so the severe pulmonary hypertension this synergistic effect of inhaled nitric oxide plus milnone sounds to be good because you are thinking action at two levels action at after load that is what pulmonary artery hypertension and action of the ventricular level as inodilatory effect or what i talk inotropism or lysotropism action which is a cardiac relaxation action which is by milnone which is useful so milnone is used in cases of pphn associated with ventricular dysfunction along with nitric oxide when there is inadequate oxygenation no less response to nitric but again you should control first dysfunction also then nitric will work so that is what is the role of this one dosage i think a lot of you know about 50 to 75 maintenance 0.3 to 1 hypotension is another problem of the milnone so monitor that we requires fluids we require isopressor in this combination that is required so what this case taught you this case taught me that initial stabilization and optimization of the blood pressure but in cases of myocardial dysfunction you can use milnone that's what approach by functional echo you could able to document in these babies that is about the role of milnone what about the vasopressors that's another separate question vasopressors or in the or inotropes in the pphn you have dopamine you have dobutamine you have epinephrine norepinephrine vasopressin all those things as you all know you deal with the right ventricular dysfunction you deal with the left ventricular dysfunction and you deal with the pulmonary aspiration high in short you know that dopamine has action on mainly alpha receptor and some action on beta receptor also naturally after the 10 miles you have more action on alpha receptor so the dopamine has yes very good vasopressor action but unfortunately dopamine also has a pulmonary vascular action that means dopamine worsens your pulmonary vasodilation it is a vasoconstrictor effect so it's a systemic vasoconstrictor as well as pulmonary vasoconstrictor so in case of pulmonary hypertension it will worsen so b i have stopped using dopamine last 10 years in my unit for sepsis cases or meconium cases where you have hypertension where you have pulmonary hypertension pulmonary hypertension plus hypertension you are in big trouble for use of dopamine because dopamine will worsen your pulmonary vasodilation 
What about norepinephrine? Fantastic drug which acts on alpha receptor. Along with that alpha receptor action, along with that alpha receptor action, dopamine decreases your pulmonary acid resistance. Very important statement I'm making. Sorry, not dopamine, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine decreases your pulmonary acid resistance. One side is increases your systemic acid resistance, and another side there is a pulmonary acid dilator. That's the beauty of norepinephrine. Hence, we are using norepinephrine as our drug in cases of late onset sepsis as a vasodilatory shock, which is always associated with the pulmonary hypertension. Hence, we are using this norepinephrine unit. One of the resident again, DM resident has compared norepinephrine versus epinephrine and norepinephrine sound to be equally effective. Hence, we are using norepinephrine. Again, that RCT is in the pipeline for publication. Comparison of norepinephrine versus epinephrine. What about, what about the epinephrine? Yes, epinephrine has a very good effect on the vasopressor, that is alpha receptor action. It also has action on the heart, which improves, but naturally, you have to be very careful about, again, small action of epinephrine, about vasopressor action, about the pulmonary vasculature. So that is about epinephrine. What about vasopressin? Again, vasopressin has a similar effect like norepinephrine. Vasopressin has an effect like increase in system gas resistance and decrease in pulmonary acid resistance. So it is reserved for refractory pulmonary hypertension. We do use vasopressin rarely. If my noradrenaline fails, so then I add as a vasopressin in the unit as that one. Dovitamine, mainly in cases of ventricular dysfunction. The dosage, as you know, but dovitamine also you have to be careful about hypertension. Milrinone, we discuss in detail as ionodilator. That's what we use as a dovitamine. Hydrocortisone, yes. Especially in cases of sepsis-related pulmonary hypertension, I use the hydrocortisone as a crisis dose, one milligram per kg per dose, six hourly, mostly three to five days, and do get good results about hydrocortisone. That's what we use. So what I told you that, I told you the two drugs. I told you these two drugs, which is one, which is non-epinephrine, and I told you this vasopressin. The non-epinephrine, as you know, as alpha receptor action as a systemic vasoconstrictor. And there is alpha-2 receptor, which releases your nitric oxide synthesis or nitric oxide release leads to pulmonary Very important action. Same thing about vasopressin as V1 receptors are vasoconstrictor and V2 receptors are specially release of nitric and vasodilatation. So these two drugs, these two drugs, now one more RCT going with my unit is comparison of norepinephrine versus vasopressin in sepsis. Because the, these two drugs are very important. What I'm talking as when I take a class later on about sepsis, this is also very important in those ones. I told you that I don't use the dopamine because it has pulmonary, systemic as well as pulmonary vasoconstrictive effect. And I just discussed about milrinone as I know dilator. I just discussed about dobutamine as ventricular function. So this chart is simple chart where you can think about using this chart. What we can think about using this chart as, sorry. What I told you about the blood pressure normal, ventricular function good, cell drive, nitric oxide. Blood pressure normal, ventricular dysfunction, well, you know. Blood pressure low, ventricular obstruction good, noradrenaline, adrenaline, vasopressin with fluid. Low blood pressure, ventricular dysfunction, combination of milrinone plus noradrenaline. And this combination is very useful, which I need to document as observational study. Combination of noradrenaline and milrinone in late onset sepsis. Again, those are the patients where we can think. I know it's going too long, but I hope I hope it's okay for you guys um, because still there is some material left. Akash, should I continue? How many more slides, sir? Probably again fifteen more minutes. Okay, sir. Please continue. Um, uh, or that's what uh, that's what uh, another case, which is the which is the term baby, which was stable, which was with mother breastfeeding, and then deteriorated. Acidosis, high lactate, you know the diagnosis. Most of you will do the echo, and that echo with the TR jet, yes, there is a TR jet, but with the TR jet, there is a parallel circulation. 
So this is another event of pulmonary hypertension with a with associated with associated. You can see the parallel circulation, and this parallel circulation naturally you need to think about you need to think about keeping the duct patent here, and the Keeping that duct pattern, what we call duct dependent circulation, we require prostaglandin. And as you know about the prostaglandin here, we know the prostaglandins basically. The prostaglandin again, through this pathway of cyclic AMP, acts as vasodilator. Prostaglandin keeps that duct pattern, reduces your pressure overload. So that is what action of these prostaglandins, what we use in this case, so pulmonary hypertension. Naturally, the dosage, as you know, but be careful about using prostaglandin because of the hypotension, systemic hypotension, apnea, these are the side effects. So the major side effects basically is hypotension and apnea. So be careful about using of this one. The fourth condition of pulmonary hypertension is a plain lung disease, severe RDS or severe pneumonia with parenchymal lung disease with left to right. What you require is lung recruitment. These are the four conditions what you compare. So these are the four conditions which we saw. Naturally, the naturally we saw the pulmonary hypertension with the severe TRJ and the bidirectional PDA. Nitric and sildenafil is the drug of choice. What we saw, LV dysfunction. We saw the or dysfunction of the ventricle. We saw the mildenone as the drug of choice. We also saw the lung recruitment in cases of plain lung disease, and we saw the drug dependent circulation where prostaglandin even or prostin drug of choice in these cases. Now, a few of the alternative therapies which you should know, which are important, which are coming out in a good way. These are the PGI2, endothelial receptor, and hydrocortisone. So, as you know, these process cyclins are systemic and pulmonary dilatation. Again, problem with hypertension, but they act through the cyclic AMP. Just now we saw the PGE2 and PG, so PGE1 and PGI2, they are acting through the cyclic AMP, leading to the vasodilatation. There are a lot of studies. But most of the importance are now coming out for chronic pulmonary hypertension for BPD, BPD pulmonary hypertension, that they are coming out. So inhaled prostacyclines, a lot of studies are coming out. If you see the uh, iloprost or ipoprostin, they are the one which are coming out in a big way. And in the West, they are using quite a long way. What about bosenton? Yes, probably from Indian setup, that's a good drug. That is ET1 antagonist. Again, observational studies, and the future trial, that's what you saw that they all have, you know that that bosenton actually has the ET receptor antagonism because ET receptor has a constrictive effect that will lead to the relaxation as vasodilatation. Hence, the bosenton naturally PPHM not responding to oxygen or in electroxy synthesis, mainly for chronic pulmonary hypertension, you can use one to two milligram per kg per dose 12 hourly. But be careful about hepatotoxicity, monitor those enzymes. That is about bosenton. And Cochrane about bosenton? Yes, we need to think about more studies, but definitely that's where we require. This is where about the preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. But I told you I'm going to take another class on the preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. We'll update you guys uh, about the uh, session about that one, about preterm BPD pulmonary hypertension. But what is there is sildenafil. Mildenone, Bosenton, that is a Flolon, Iloprost, and Terrafine. But unfortunately, these drugs are not freely, but these are available for us. Mainly, these are available for us, and that is what we use in cases of Indian scenario. Steroids, as you all know, just I told you, the last discussion comes out as steroid. That is what we all talk. Um, Maxwell, I will not go, but this is the chart, probably what you need to understand what we just discussed stabilization with inhaled nitric oxide, sildenafil with blood pressure stabilization, fluid vasopressor steroids, myocardial dysfunction with milinone, bosenton as a third line. This is what uh, Professor Martin Toko is writing. As you know, the neurotologic questions, series of the questions, this that series, six books by, um, by this one, and the one book is on the neurotal cardiology. Now the book name this year will be neurotal hemodynamics, and that hemodynamics, Professor Martin has requested our team to write on hemodynamics in the developing countries. And this is a chart we have proposed for the pulmonary hypertension management in developing countries, especially when we lack those ones. So that is what at present moment, our thought process about these ones. I will not go in detail. There is a separate class on the 
emerging drugs and animal experiments. It's, it's a huge class for DM candidate. I know you might be thinking I could have taken this one as a separate class or you wanted to listen this one, but again, it's a big session. So I think uh, I will not go into that detail. I do understand you all will be interested in this class. We will one day we'll take this class also. So dear friends, I know there is a lot of time shoot out from my side, but there were a lot of points I have to cover. I told you there are 10 questions, transitional circulation, pathophysiology, uh, echocardiography, um, management part one, management part two as I know to management part three as separate nitric or sildenafil or what you can consider as the uh, additional vasodilator therapy, those are the things. But what we learn, lung recruitment is very important.